Maria handed me the letter she had read at the wedding reception. I wasn't completely clueless about the situation, but I knew I needed to say something sincere to Maria. Maria, thank you for being born. I wish your father could have seen you in your wedding attire too. Maria's personality changed dramatically after my husband Ted disappeared 15 years ago. Previously, she had been a bright and curious child, but she became timid and withdrawn. It's likely that her father's absence had something to do with it. Maria collapsed in tears upon hearing my words. I initially thought it was due to overwhelming emotions, but something seemed off. She grabbed my hand while crying, her grip so strong it might leave a bruise. Mom, I'm sorry. There's something I've been keeping quiet about. An unsettling feeling washed over me. She continued. Did Dad betray us? Her eyes held unmistakable hatred. I felt a chill run down my spine. What do you mean? I hurried back home, desperately digging up the spot Maria had indicated. The shovel hit something with a thud. Buried in the soil was a cookie can. Don't open this, I myself warned. Despite my sudden fear, I couldn't leave her to face the truth alone. I steeled myself and opened the can. Encounters come unexpectedly. It was a springtime event when I was 28 years old. This is Mr. Ted Astrid, our new employee. The young man introduced by my boss bowed slightly. Starting today, teach him everything he needs to know. With those words, he promptly headed to the meeting room. I'm Sophia Barlow. Let's start with the basics, and feel free to ask anything if you have questions. His gaze is fixed on the name tag on my chest. Are you listening? Ted? Just as I was about to pay attention, he turned a friendly smile toward me and said something unexpected. Miss Sophia Barlow, that's a very beautiful name. Being told this by a new employee, who was not only meeting me for the first time but also ten years younger, caught me off guard. Oh. I'm sorry. I blurted out something embarrassing, didn't I? He looked more embarrassed than I did and took a seat at the desk next to mine. Seeing his profile, I noticed that his ears were bright red. Perhaps he wasn't such a bad guy after all. However, as someone in a supervisory role, I felt anxious about the initial words directed at me. Would he perform his duties properly? I wondered if I should provide guidance based on the attitude towards other senior employees. Yet, my anxiety was unfounded. He remembered what I taught him one after another, and his friendly personality proved effective in winning over clients. His earnest dedication to work made me gradually recognize his abilities. And one year later, when he secured a major contract on his own, we decided to celebrate by going out for a meal together. Your teaching style was effective. Despite his achievement, he remained humble. Although our initial impression of each other wasn't great, by that time, I had grown comfortable being around him. But now that you're so capable at work, you'll probably get even busier. I said, feeling a mix of sadness and uncertainty. Ted's response surprised me. Even so, would you still go out to eat with me occasionally? His reddened ears weren't solely due to alcohol. Somehow, I had a premonition. However, I couldn't respond to the feelings of my junior, who was ten years younger than me. By that time, there will be more gatherings with people more important than me. I tried to evade, but his gaze was serious. Ms. Barlow, I'm serious. He leaned forward. We locked eyes for a few seconds, and I nodded. It wasn't just swept away by his momentum, somewhere deep down, 
I was drawn to him. Ted Astrid, the man who would later become my husband. Things were going smoothly, and I got married around the time I turned 30. After that, we were blessed with a daughter, and the three of us lived a happy life. Or at least, that's how it was supposed to be. I'll never forget that moment, spring when my daughter Maria was five years old. After putting her on the kindergarten bus, I was chatting with a neighbor when my phone rang. It was a call from Mr. Johnson, my former boss whom I had only met through my husband Ted's stories since I quit my job before Maria's birth. Hello? Ms. Barlow, no, I mean, Miss Astrid. Mr. Johnson's voice came through the phone. And with that abrupt interruption, my life took an unexpected turn. I'm glad to hear you're doing well. By the way, I haven't been able to get in touch with Ted, do you know anything about him? What? Ted was supposed to be in Hong Kong on a business trip for the past three days. According to my former boss, he had not been on a business trip and had not come to work since Monday of that week. Anyway, you can try to get in touch with him yourself. With that, he hung up the phone. Recently Ted had been complaining that his business trips had increased. Every time he did, I would comfort and encourage him. After all, just having you listen to me makes me feel at ease. I feel all wrapped up and warm. Thanks for everything. He had said such a thing. We had both been feeling uplifted that this long trip was because he was expected to have a future, and that he would surely get a promotion in the next round of reviews. Where in the world had my husband, who had taken Monday off to pack for the next day's insistence, gone? After hanging up the phone from my former boss, I cut off my chat with a neighbor and returned home to try to call Ted's cell phone. But it was not turned on. The announcement echoed emphatically. I had never been unable to reach him before. I wondered if he had been involved in an accident or incident somewhere. Suddenly driven by anxiety, I called all the contacts on my cell phone. Ted's parents, his siblings, and every friend I knew. But no one knew where Ted was. The days that followed were so painful that I don't even want to recall them. My in-laws suggested that I file a missing persons report for Ted, but I never found a single clue. I shamelessly asked my former boss for help, reapplied for a job at my old place of employment, and worked as if to fill the void left by my husband's absence. But at the same time, my daughter Maria's smile began to diminish. My life was completely different than it had been before, even though I was working shorter hours. For Maria, her father was gone, and she had less time to spend with her mother. Her loneliness was painfully obvious, but we both had to get over it. I was uncomfortable because I was treated within the company as the wife whose husband had run away from her and the poor woman who had to clean up the mess. Only my colleagues, who had known me for a long time, treated me normally, but I could see a wavering pity in their eyes. I gritted my teeth, even though it almost drove me mentally to the edge. I acted as cheerfully as possible in front of Maria. I did not want her to feel anxious or lonely. I wanted Maria to have a life without any inconvenience, and that was all I wanted. When she was in elementary school and getting used to life with just the two of us, I made a request to my boss. As long as it's not too much for you. He was probably concerned about me, but I could only thank him in a clerical way because I had lost faith in anyone at that time. Then I started an online store as a side business. Fifteen years have passed since then. I muttered to myself as I watched the cherry blossoms begin to bloom. Mom, what's wrong? Maria, who was walking in front of me, looked back. The image of her in my memory overlapped with her face. 
Don't tell me you're still nervous, Mom. She laughed mischievously. No way. I haven't been nervous since the beginning. I made a playful show of it and we walked side by side laughing. Today we were meeting Maria and her fiancé's family. Maria, now a fully grown woman, had met her fiancé at the city hall where she had started working after graduating from college. She had graduated from college and started working as a public servant, so it would have been better to get married a little later. Maria was only 23 years old. The day I was first introduced to him, I blurted it out, but Maria said it matter-of-factly. Even you had a gut feeling when you married my dad, didn't you? I had a complicated feeling as my own black history was dredged up, but it was indeed true. No matter what anyone says, I will marry this man. Once I made up my mind, I would go straight ahead. Her character was just like mine. If it looks like you're going to fail, come back to our house as soon as possible. It won't come to that. We enjoyed such conversations many times during the days leading up to the wedding. A few months later, Maria's wedding took place. I watched from a distant seat as my daughter was surrounded by many congratulations. Toward the end of the reception, it was time for the standard bridal letter to the parents. I thought I had told her I didn't want that part because it was too embarrassing. Even though she had said she wouldn't do it either. I couldn't have tears in my eyes in front of so many people. No matter how much sympathy and comfort I had received since Ted's disappearance, I had come this far without crying in public. Let me play the strong mother who never cries, no matter what, until the very end. With such determination in my heart, I stood on the stage without any prompting. To my beloved mother. Maria began to read the letter. She began by telling me about the time when Ted was still around, how she missed him when he disappeared and she had less time to spend with me, how she started helping me a lot to support me when I was absorbed in my work, her adolescent rebellion, and how grateful she was to have lived an unencumbered life through high school and college. All the events described in the letter, and more than that, the casual days we spent together, came back to me as if it were only yesterday. I will never cry. I made eye contact with Maria and was about to laugh with her, as we both always do, when Maria's voice stopped. I looked at her and saw my daughter crying in her beautiful wedding dress. Seeing her again, she was so beautiful, I felt as if she were a different person. Maria was so young and had always remained a child in my mind. But after today, every day will be different from the one before. When did she become such a beautiful and wonderful lady? I can vividly remember everything that has happened but she seems to have already gone beyond my reach as she cries while reading my letter to me. Then suddenly tears spilled from my eyes. And they poured out one after another. The tears were a mixture of being proud of my daughter who had become a full-fledged person, wishing her eternal happiness, and feeling the loneliness of being alone in the future. After the wedding reception was over, I made my way to the bride's waiting room. Maria, who was taking a break, came running up to me. I never thought you would cry, Mom. In all the years we had lived together, I had never cried in front of her, no matter how painful it was. She seemed surprised that I had cried. I told you not to read your letter to me. To hide my embarrassment, I intentionally pretended to be angry. But Maria, who usually gets into my groove, had a mysterious look on her face. Then she handed me the letter she had read at the reception. I am not so air-headed as to make a joke here. I must say something to Maria in all seriousness. Maria, thank you for being born. 
I wish your father could have seen you in your finest moment. After Ted disappeared, Maria's personality underwent a drastic change. Before that, she was a bright and curious child, but she became timid and withdrawn. It was likely related to her father's absence. She wondered if she was an unwanted child, if her existence was the reason her father was no longer there. To avoid feeling unnecessary or unwanted, she began to carefully observe people's reactions and moods. Once Maria realized this, I showered her with affection, ensuring she didn't feel anxious. By the time she reached adulthood, she had returned to her cheerful self. Today was a special day for her, and I didn't want to see her sad. I hoped she would focus on the future rather than being trapped by the past. For me, Maria's birth was the greatest happiness. Surely, her father, who lives on in Maria's memories, had eagerly awaited this day. That was the message I desperately wanted to convey. However, when Maria heard those words, she suddenly broke down in tears. She seemed to be deeply moved, but something was off. While crying, she gripped my hand with such force that I feared it might leave a bruise. Mom, I'm sorry. There's something I've kept silent about for a long time. An unpleasant premonition washed over me. I didn't want to hear what came next. But my hopes were dashed. Maria slowly revealed the truth. Mom, did Dad betray us? Her eyes held unmistakable hatred. I felt my blood run cold. What do you mean? Even if it were true, how did Maria come to know such a thing? Of course Maria understood that Ted had disappeared, but where did he go and why was he gone? I didn't even know those things. For a long time, I wasn't sure when to tell you. But I didn't want you to be alone with the secret once I was gone. Apparently, the secret was buried in a flower bed in the garden of the house. I'm sorry I didn't tell you until today. At that moment, the groom came into our waiting room after changing his clothes. He was surprised to see Maria crying in pain because she was so sorry for me. I understand. It's okay. After briefly explaining the situation to him, I left Maria to him and ran out of the room. It takes 20 minutes by train from the hotel where the wedding was held to my home. Without caring about my appearance, I ran to the station and squeezed through the crowd to catch the train. The train felt slower than usual. I tried to calm my frustrated self multiple times, but it didn't work. Even after getting off the train, I continued running and finally reached home. Despite being out of breath, I desperately dug up the spot Maria had specified. The shovel hit something with a thud. Buried in the soil was a cookie can. I knew I shouldn't open it. Suddenly, fear gripped me. But I couldn't burden Maria alone. I reminded myself not to avert my eyes from the truth and opened the can. Inside were several photographs. Ted and a heavily made-up woman were captured in each one. As I examined them, I discovered intimate photos of the two entangled in passion. Instinctively, I looked away. Could this be the reason Maria mentioned for Ted's disappearance? For a while, I remained crouched in the garden, unable to move. Why would something like this be buried here? The cold night air still enveloped me. The next day, when Maria returned home, I asked her for the truth. It came from Dad's desk. Was it the same desk we had kept in the house for a while after Ted disappeared? I had thoroughly searched it for any clues. I've also examined that desk. I replied, my voice still shaky and unintentionally accusatory. Maria explained the situation with an apologetic tone. 
Ted disappeared. And when Maria saw me rummaging through his desk, she assumed there was something there. Although she didn't know what it was, she desperately searched through the contents of the desk. Eventually, she found an envelope hidden deep in the bottom drawer. I thought this could help mom. When she opened the envelope, the same photographs emerged. Young Maria couldn't fully comprehend what was happening in those pictures, but they made her feel incredibly uncomfortable. She felt she shouldn't show me these photos, so she hid them in the cookie can where she kept her toys. I intended to keep this from you, mom. But what if you found it after I left? It was too heavy a burden for a child to bear alone. To think she had been hiding this all along, I had believed I was protecting her, but perhaps it was the other way around. I'm sorry, Maria. I whispered, my anger toward Ted welling up. To leave such cruel evidence for the family I abandoned. It was a feeling of boiling anger at his irresponsibility. Even if I let my emotions take over in anger, nothing would begin. No, in this case, it should end properly. I headed to the detective agency with the photograph. I had struggled so much to find Ted's whereabouts until now. But based on that photo, the detectives easily pinpointed Ted's location, a tower apartment towering near a certain station, visible in the photo. They staked out the place and confirmed Ted and the woman coming and going. And they even determined the room number for me. They said Ted frequently used food delivery services, so I decided to impersonate a delivery person and sneak into the apartment building. When I rang the intercom at the auto-locked entrance, I heard a familiar voice. After giving the delivery company's name, the automatic door opened with a polite please. The elevator ascended rapidly to the upper floors. My heart raced, and nausea washed over me. It wasn't too late to turn back. Despite questioning myself repeatedly, I walked all the way to the door where Ted and the woman were likely to be. With trembling hands, I pressed the intercom button, adjusting my face mask and pulling my cap down low. Hi. Once again, I heard a familiar voice through the intercom. Delivery. Nerves got the best of me, and I accidentally stumbled over my words. What kind of delivery was this? Surely, he'd find it suspicious. But I couldn't say anything more. What should I do? Just as I considered fleeing, I heard the click of the door unlocking. Did Eve order something, I wonder? The face that appeared on the other side was unforgettable. Though my memories were frozen in my twenties, there was no mistaking the man who stepped out, my husband, Ted. He still wore that friendly smile from back then. Ah. Uh. My voice slipped out, but Ted didn't seem to recognize me yet. Ha. Huh. What is the delivery? Ted glanced around me, noting that I only carried a shoulder bag. And then. What's going on? Ted? A nearly half-naked woman emerged from behind Ted. This was her, Eve McEnroe, 49 years old. Her parents seemed to be rich, and she lived an elegant life here. I recalled the information the detective had given me. She was the woman Ted had been living off since his disappearance. Seeing her face, I regained my composure and anger. I removed my face mask and cap, then addressed the dumbfounded pair. I'm Sophia Astrid. Ted Astrid's wife. Ted stared at my face for a moment, then... Ah! He let out a panicked scream and fled deeper into the apartment. Oh dear. As I watched Ted's retreating figure, Eve stood before me. 
How bold of you to claim to be the wife of a man you haven't seen in years. She crossed her arms, a smug smile playing on her lips. But I couldn't back down now. Likewise, it seems my husband has been quite taken care of all this time. I smiled sweetly and delivered my introduction. Eve continued to scrutinize me, as if examining every inch of my body. Can you explain to me what has happened so far? I asked as if to shake off her gaze, and she told me a story similar to the one the detective had told me. One day, Ted met Eve at a club during a business trip. Impressed by him, Eve brought him to her apartment, which also served as her villa. After that, Ted returned to our home where Maria and I were waiting, seemingly unfazed. However, he started visiting Eve frequently. Gradually, Ted became enamored with Eve's wealth and the pampered lifestyle she provided. Since leaving us that day, he has been living under her care. He no longer resembles the responsible, dignified man he once was. Are you here to reclaim Ted? Her nonchalant tone irritated me. I replied, No, I don't need him anymore. I just have one last thing to do as his wife. Eve cocked her head. My husband, Ted Astrid, and Eve McEnroe. I would like to charge you both for alimony. Eve nodded her head without changing color. How much compensation are you seeking? With a provocative glance, she continued, Name your desired amount. But her expression changed when I uttered the next words. Oops, sorry, the name McEnroe belongs to your family. Miss Field, I'll also consult with Mr. George Field, your husband. With that, I left, knowing that revealing Ted's existence could cause a major scandal. The impact on Eve remains uncertain. But surprisingly, my strategy worked flawlessly. With that, I bowed my head and left the place. I knew from the detective agency's research that Eve had a husband. I heard that he was married to her for political reasons, but if this became known, it would be a serious problem. How much effect this fact would have on her was unknown, but it was surprisingly effective. Don't tell my husband. Eve's cries echoed through the hallway. But I didn't look back and headed for the elevator. She was almost half naked and did not follow me until she ran out into the hallway. I exhaled heavily as the elevator headed toward the ground. Then I walked out and stretched out. Ah, that felt good. People on the street looked at me, but I didn't care. I looked up at the clear blue sky as I made my way to Maria's new home. Through a lawyer, I was able to dissolve my marriage with Ted. Of course, I demanded alimony from both him and Eve. It seemed that Eve's husband and parents chose to sever ties with her. Despite being a well-bred daughter, she had deceived a younger man using her parents' wealth, even though she was already married. Such behavior would have caused significant damage to their prestigious family reputation if it became widely known. Although Eve initially showed willingness to pay the alimony amount I desired, I received more than the court ordered sum in my account. It appeared that there was not only my remuneration, but also the giving and receiving of money to other people. Where did Ted, abandoned by Eve, who was cut off from her family by her own actions, disappear to? Despite the outstanding alimony owed to me, I had no desire to find out his whereabouts. Mom, is this everything we need to dispose of? Maria carried out the items from the room. She had been helping me with the move, as this house was too large for me to live in alone. Well, I suppose so. Let's take a little break. We sat down and sipped cold iced tea, chatting away. You know, Mom, there's something else I've been keeping from you. 
I nearly choked on my iced tea. We don't need to discuss that anymore. But Maria's expression remained calm, and her hand rested on her belly. Could it be? I wondered. Yes, Maria was carrying new life within her. And there's one more thing. I saw Dad the other day. She spoke matter-of-factly. During a trip with her husband, she spotted Ted walking around, looking disheveled. It was a three-hour bullet train ride from here. He must be struggling, but honestly, I didn't feel any desire to help him. I couldn't even believe he was my dad. In Maria's memories, Ted probably still shone brightly. I stood up, wanting to change the subject. All right. Let's put that topic to rest. Back to cleaning. Maria, get rid of anything unnecessary. If only memories and emotions could be discarded as easily. With those thoughts, I continued tidying up the room. And two years have passed. Maria's family visited the house I used as both an office and a home. Grandma, your business still seems to be thriving. My granddaughter, still unsteady on her feet, toddled over to me with outstretched arms. Memories of Maria when she was little flooded back, but I pushed away the darker ones. More important than painful memories of the past was what lay before me now. There was no time to dwell on unnecessary things. We still have many joyful and brilliant memories to create. How did you find this story? Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Until next time in the next video. Noel, run away now. Leaving those words, the phone immediately cut off, and no matter how many times I tried calling back, I couldn't get through. My usually calm mother sounded desperate, convincing me that something must be wrong. What happened to mom? Mother had been battling an illness for several years and had recently been hospitalized. Before her hospitalization, she called every day, but now, being in the hospital, she hadn't called, which I found strange. I rushed to the hospital, but by the time I arrived, she had already passed away. This can't be happening. Overwhelmed with grief, I couldn't say anything. The hospital where she was admitted was about an hour or two away from my apartment, and I regretted not acting sooner. The meaning of runaway now remained a mystery. I thought I would never understand its meaning. However, amidst my grief and confusion, I unexpectedly discovered the meaning behind her words. I'm Noelle, a 25-year-old office worker. My parents divorced before I can remember, and my mother raised me with great care by herself. After becoming an adult and living alone, I saw her less often, but as a child, she took me to my favorite amusement parks and sent me to college despite financial struggles. She was a very kind mother. Although she passed away after a long battle with her illness, the mysterious words run away now stayed in my mind. I returned to my childhood home for the first time in a while to prepare for the funeral. What? What is this? Feeling nostalgic as I entered the living room, I found the room in complete disarray. The wardrobes and closets were particularly ransacked, and I realized that my mother's valuables were missing. The necklace I gave her with my first paycheck was gone too. I immediately contacted the police, but they said it might be the work of a serial burglar that's been active recently. I left this matter to the police and proceeded with the funeral preparations. On that day, many people came to mourn my mother. People who had been kind to us in the past attended, bringing back nostalgic memories, but I felt a pang of loneliness realizing I would live without family from now on. Still. I decided to see my mother off with a smile, sharing memories with everyone. 
After the funeral, a man approached me. Long time no see. Do you remember me? I didn't recognize the man who spoke to me so familiarly and wondered if such a young person could be one of my mother's acquaintances. I'm sorry, who are you? Well, you were little, so it's not surprising you don't remember. I'm your older brother, Dominic. He smiled warmly. I was shocked to hear that I had an older brother. Moreover, I had never met this person before. As I was skeptical, Dominic showed me a photo. Look, here's mom, and this is you. That is definitely my mother when she was younger. The woman was unmistakably my mother, and the child next to her looked just like Dominic. It seemed true that he was my brother, and I was happy to know I had family. But why had mother hidden his existence from me? But I never knew I had an older brother. I see. It must have been hard losing mom. But now I'll be here to support you. With his words, I nodded. Yes. But the questions remained. I had often wished for siblings when I was young. It seemed unlike my mother not to find a way for us to meet. Maybe she had her reasons. I tried to convince myself of this and suddenly thought of something else to ask. By the way, what about Dad? Didn't he come? Oh, Dad said he has nothing to do with us anymore and didn't come. I see. I hope I can meet him someday. Dad's a terrible person. He practically abandoned you and mom. Even though they divorced, it seemed cruel for him not to attend her funeral. Dominic continued to check on me, often inviting me out for meals. During one of these outings, he told me that after the divorce, Dad frequently asked mom for money, and he was worried that he might come after me next. Dominic seemed very concerned about me and having a brother felt reassuring. However, I was soon to discover a shocking truth during the process of sorting through my mother's belongings. About a month after the funeral, while finishing up the organization of her belongings, I found a notebook in a dresser. As I flipped through it, I realized it was my mother's diary. It seemed she had written in it daily since before the divorce, and there were ten volumes in total. Feeling a bit guilty, I opened it. Seeing her neat handwriting brought tears to my eyes. Dominic came to visit. Even though we had agreed never to meet again as per my ex-husband's conditions, I was so happy that I secretly gave him some pocket money. I couldn't help but chuckle. It was endearing to see such interactions that I was unaware of, but the tone gradually changed. Dominic visited again today. But he just said give me money and left. I began to feel uneasy about my brother's behavior as described by my mother. His actions were increasingly troubling. Today, Dominic threatened me and I gave him money again. Indeed, it was written in my mother's handwriting. What does she mean by threatened? It gave me a bad feeling. When I refused to give him money, he said hurtful things. Today, he told me, your only worth is your money. The trembling handwriting made it seem all too real. Why would my brother say such things? I'm enduring it because it's his rebellious phase. As I read on, trying to understand her perspective, I stumbled upon a horrifying entry. Today, when I refused, he brought a knife from the dining room and threatened me. I was so scared that I gave him the money. I know I shouldn't keep doing this, but what can I do? I couldn't believe what I was reading. I was horrified by my brother's true nature and felt ashamed for not realizing it sooner. The person described in the diary seemed like a different person from the brother who had kindly smiled at me. 
even though we live apart. He's still my precious son. I can't go to the police because it might be due to the divorce. Her words squeezed my heart. I understood her feelings, but I couldn't see someone who threatened my beloved mother with a knife as my brother anymore. He said he'd extort money from my sister too. I can't let that happen. It seemed she kept his existence a secret to protect me, but her diary revealed everything. I have to protect her from Dominic before I go. Surely, the phone call that day was meant to warn me about my brother. She must have been afraid he would harm me. Thinking about how he tormented my mother and attended her funeral with a straight face made me furious. Holding my mother's diary, I decided to take revenge on my brother. Why did you call me here so suddenly? I have something to tell you. Three days later, I invited my brother to the house. Being alone with someone who once used a knife to threaten my mother seemed dangerous, but I had a plan. I know what you did to mom. When I said that, he widened his eyes slightly in shock, but quickly returned to a composed demeanor. He intended to keep denying it no matter what. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. You were extorting money from her, threatening her. No, I don't know anything about that. He had no intention of admitting it and continued to play the role of the kind brother. Realizing this wouldn't get anywhere, I decided to perform a little act to get him to confess. Before she died, she told me everything. I pretended not to know to get back at you. Hearing this, his attitude visibly changed. Huh. He sighed, slouched in his chair, and looked at me with annoyance. So, you found out, huh? Why did you threaten her and even use a knife? To my question, he responded. Hmm. And after a mock thoughtful pause. Stress relief? He said with a smile. There wasn't a hint of guilt in his expression, as if he believed he had done nothing wrong. She never went to the police because she was thinking of you. Of course not. I'm her son. I was just getting pocket money. He said without a shred of remorse. I felt dizzy. I couldn't believe this man was my blood brother. I'm going to the police. Huh. They won't listen to you without evidence. I have evidence. Saying this, I pulled out her diary. She wrote everything down in here. I could just tear that up right now. There are many more diaries and pieces of evidence she left. Destroying this one won't help. His face twisted. Realizing he couldn't easily erase the evidence, he began trembling with anger. So, I just have to stop you from going to the police? Shouting, he kicked his chair and started knocking things off the shelves. The room became a mess as vases and cups shattered. Once he had knocked everything over, he ran to the dining area and grabbed a knife, slowly approaching me. If you agree to be my cash cow, I'll let you go. At that moment, the sound of a police siren echoed nearby. He seemed to be very afraid of the police, looking around in panic. When the police entered the house, he was still holding the knife, looking bewildered. Why are the police here now? He shouted in frustration. He seemed shaken by the presence of the officers in the living room. I asked them to come. Huh. He looked at me dumbfounded. I decided to reveal the big part of my act. I asked a colleague from my company to call the police at this time. What? I figured her diary alone might not be enough evidence, so I planned to have the police catch him in the act of threatening me with a knife. 
It was all a setup. Stop messing around. He shouted, lunging at me, but was immediately subdued by the police. Hey, stop it. Let go of me. He struggled violently, trying to break free, but with two officers restraining him, there was no escape. After they handcuffed him, he seemed to realize he had no way out and became quiet. I'm sorry, forgive me. I was wrong. Desperate to avoid being arrested, he started apologizing to me frantically, his face contorting as if about to cry. No matter how much you apologize, it won't reach her anymore. Who cares about that? Just don't involve the police. It's not that simple for us. She was always afraid of you. Parents are just cash cows for their kids. He kept cursing, but I ignored him. As he was being led away by the police, he started sobbing. I'm sorry. Please, not the police. I won't forgive you for what you did to her. Officers, take him away. As I declared this, his face twisted in agony. Thinking only of his own protection to the end, he was finally taken away by the police with a miserable look, tears and snot streaming down his face. Later, the police investigation revealed that he was a habitual burglar and was sent to prison. It seemed he had been desperately avoiding the police because he feared exposure of his past crimes. He was also the one who had ransacked the house and pawned the necklace I had given her. Even in prison, he kept causing trouble, extending his sentence repeatedly. Although I lost my dear mother, I am now engaged to the colleague who called the police that day. He is kind and understanding, and I am happy to have met him. I'm sure she is watching over us from heaven. When we visit her grave together, I know she will be happy for us. How did you like this story? Please subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.